I just think this was a surprise for like you know lots of Bowie fans when this song came out in the 80s. You were thinking, geez, you know, David Bowie and Pat Metheny, how the hell's that going to work? And it just kind of did. It just shows how kind of like you know the best artists can always kind of smash any preconception you have of them. I just thought this is one of the best lyrics that he'd written for a long time as well. David Bowie's always done that thing of doing something with Bing Crosby, and you were just like, <laughs> how the hell did that work? And then Pat Metheny, I think that's just part of his genius, I suppose. Really. He does seem to be able to move into any area yeah, and, yeah. and not just do it well, but they do it brilliantly. Exactly. No, it's not just. It doesn't just seem as if he's just like you know working around the, you know the fringes of something. He actually just goes for it, and it just. It's more often than not, it's just absolutely amazing when he does it. You know, it's sickening in many ways, isn't it? Yeah. It is sickening. Yeah, <laughs> it's just when you just stick to one thing, really, you can just you know let a scrabber on the periphery for any crumbs that might fall off your table. <laughs> it, anyway, this is not America. Uh, next today, you've gone for Lloyd Cole and Forest Fire. I just kind of like this track because I remember when Lloyd Cole came out in the early eighties, and uh, I think their first single was something called Perfect Skin, and um, there was a big hullabaloo kind of about Lloyd Cole. People were saying he's one of the greatest songwriters that came out of Britain for a long time, and you weren't quite sure about it until you actually heard this song. Then you just realised that he was a bona fide, like you know, classic songwriter. And um, I remember trying to learn this guitar solo, and it was it was hell of a challenge for me when I was a young lad. But it was just one of those moments when I actually got it right. I was like, I'll never work again. I'm top of the world, man. So you know, it's just just a lot of good memories for me. This song, and it just shows what an amazing songwriter he was. She crossed herself. I always choose an Elvis song whenever I'm asked for what music I like for the mere reason that Elvis was um, one of those moments in my life when I realised that rock and roll really mattered to people. I remember when Elvis died, I woke up in the morning ready to go to school. My parents were asleep on the set e and the curtains were closed, so they obviously hadn't been in bed all night. I was like, oh my God, somebody's died in the family, because, you know, that's what all the, it all pointed towards. Yeah, I said, who's died? And they were like, Elvis, we're not going to work today. You can take the day off school if you want. And that's when I realised how much music mattered to people. You know, that was the first time I really realised that kind of music was a seismic force in people's lives when my mother and father were just like treating it like a death in the family. How serious is that, eh? Yeah, I know it is. And the song you've chosen, The Wonder of You there, uh, that's um, one of the later Elvis ones. People mm. tend to say, oh, he'd gone off in later years, but he hadn't really, I don't think. Well, he brought something else to his songs. Yeah, people accuse him of being a bit of a pub singer towards the end. Well, if he was a pub singer, he was the best pub singer in the world. <laughs> you know, it's just, I think, you know, to actually elevate your voice, kind of like when you're standing in front of like, you know, a 40 piece band like he was by the end, it's just a talent in itself. And he always managed never to sound small in, in front of that Vegas band he had, you know, the 50, 40 people in it. And you know, and people just don't realise how much physical effort it takes just to rise above all that. And he did, he did. Uh, Nina Simone is next with Wild as the Wind. There's three versions of this song I know. There's a Johnny Mathis version, there's a version by David Bowie, and there's this one. They're the three versions I know. And I think... This just about edges out the David Bowie version. Definitely edges out the Johnny Mathis one. And um, I can never quite figure out what this lyric is about, really. It always just really manages to instill a sense of longing in me. So I went for the Nina Simone version, because also I share the same birthday with her as well. Oh, so, but there you are. Happy yeah. birthday when it comes. The story of the blues by the Mighty War is one of the great lost pop singles from the 80s. It's a little minor masterpiece. And um, you don't hear it played that much, and that's why I'd like to hear it, because it was produced by Mike Hedges, who produced a lot of our records, Design for Life, etc. And I just think it's when a producer and an artist meet and they're perfect for each other, sometimes you get a result like this, so... Good. We have played it in the past quite a lot, actually, so... Ah, okay. We're the good guys. <laughs> okay, there they are. And uh, next it's I Can't Give Back the Love I Feel For You, um, which is Sairita, although credited as something else. I love this song, and this is definitely a song that you don't hear much. She's like kind of a sweetie, right? I think she was married to CV Wonder and stuff and she passed away last year mm. and again she's always in the footnotes of Motown history but when you actually stumble upon some of her records especially from the early years she had such a pure crystal voice I think she sounds a bit like Kylie Minogue you know I wanted <laughs> Kylie Minogue to cover this and it just shows that perception one seen as pop one is seen as a classic Motown singer but at the end of the day they sound really similar so who's better but you know this song the arrangement everything this song's crying out to be a massive hit for somebody one day I think this is like my favourite pop single of the last 10 years. The Cardigans released this, I think, about three years ago. And uh, it, it wasn't as big a hit as I thought it would be. And I know how much of a crushing blow that is. As musicians, we've all released songs and thought it was going to be enormous. And then when it isn't, you just can never figure it out. And with this, I think it must have crushed them when it wasn't a worldwide hit. Because, again, this is the most plaintive, just like poetic little piece of guitar music I've heard in a long time. It's a great song. Yeah. And The Clash, you've gone for next, and The Card Cheat. Well, I picked The Card Cheat. It's an album track off London Calling, which is their best album by a million miles. And, you know, people 
people always think in the Clash were about, you know, just lots of didactic bluster. But, you know, sometimes they did things like this, the card sheet, where you can use so many influences in there. And it's just classic rock. You know, there's not an element of punk in there. And again, it just shows some of the best artists just transcend the preconceptions you have of them. And they come out with something like this and it still works. I've just got a small fascination with this band Badfinger, you know, partly because they were half Welsh, uh, two of the members in Badfinger were Welsh. Such a tragic story, you know, that two of them committed suicide. And they wrote the song Without You, you know, that um, Harry Nelson had a hit with, Mariah Carey, etc. And um, I think that was one of the reasons why there was such a tragic end to their band, because I think the rights for that song were kind of stolen off them. So they saw people making millions and millions of pounds out of that song and they never saw any of it. But they actually had a massive hit in America with this song, Baby Blue, and they're one of the great lost Apple acts from the you know, 70s. You know, they don't seem to get that much of a mention. I still play them every week. Yeah, so. they're a great band yeah. in the day, certainly. Uh, and finally, the Rolling Stones and Jumpin' Jack Flash. I remember kind of, we were all obsessed with this song when we started the band back in 1985. And um, what's, the, what's the first lyric? I was born in a crossfire hurricane. <laughs> it's just like that seemed to sum up kind of like, you know, somebody at war with themselves or the world it's just a perfect start to a record this tension there the sexuality there it's just everything and I think that's the scary thing when you form a band you listen to all these records that you love and you're thinking will we ever do anything as good as that so I'd like to play this because this is one of the benchmarks for what a great rock record is great it is too James thank you so much for choosing these pleasure <laughs>